study is five to eight. Where's Gail Mansfield? Have you heard from the quizzers? Okay. I called, trying to locate them. They're all over Saint, uh, uh, Indianapolis. All I know is they quiz Tuesday and won their first quiz Monday. They won their first quiz, and I haven't been able to make contact with them yet. So we thank the Lord that they have not been sold into slavery anywhere. They're still there. Praise God. A couple of verses of Scripture. We're, our, our full text will come from Genesis 22, but I want to read the... Uh, well, you just go to 22 of, of Genesis, and I'll read First Peter chapter 1 and, and these verses. Verse 6, Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love, and whom though now you see him not yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. That's the end of our faith, the salvation of our souls. That's what God's wanting us to get to. And one other scripture there in First Peter 4, chapter 12, beloved, uh, 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 chapter 4, verse 12, believe it. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. <laughs> For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he's evil spoken of, but on your part he's glorified. <coughs> One other scripture, Genesis 22. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt or God did try or God did test Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him. And Isaac his son claved the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young man, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. Lord, bless the teaching of the word. Bless these wonderful people. Let us learn something great about your wonderful truths. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. God bless you. Thank you. You may be seated. We're just about ready to get Abe up on the hill. And I want to talk to you tonight uh, on uh, the trial of your faith. The trial of your faith. We have now reached in Genesis 22 what uh, we might be able to call the climax of Abraham's faith. Every episode, every tragedy, every mistake, every victory has been constantly and consistently leading Abraham to this climax. <clears throat> to the place where he could climb this mountain and bring honor and glory to God. There is a mountain in our lives. There are places that God has prescribed in His divine providence that He has dealt to us in destiny that He wants us to get to. And uh, this is where Abraham is right now. But I want you to grasp this because... I wrestled uh, uh, much with trying to bring you all these prophetical and uh, type and shadow and substance and anti-top truths to you, and yet it seemed like God kept veering me off from that, because that would be some kind of candy stick, and you'd all get a big kick out of it, and none of you'd do it. And so the Lord took me the other way. And so in this Bible study tonight about the trial of our faith, 
and the climax of Abraham's faith, we must grasp at the offset of this Bible study the key ingredient to the climax of Abraham's faith. And the key ingredient has got to somehow be ingested and absorbed into us lest we believe that Abraham was Superman. And I think one of the dirtiest tricks that our adversary has ever done to us is to remove from reality Bible characters so that we really don't believe we could ever be like them. That they are some special dudes who walked across holy writ and they don't make them anymore. And that's why the majority of the world doesn't have the Holy Ghost. Because they already have told the world, well, that don't happen no more. And that's why a large segment of Christianity, or so-called Christianity, does never experience one miracle or one supernatural act. It's not because God ain't the same. It's because people's concepts are different. And they do not believe that God does that anymore. You would be amazed at the periodicals that I read, editorials I read, magazines I read, books that I read, that some of the largest so-called leading denominations in this world are to me very blatant with their declarations and their statements that God no longer deals with anyone on a personal level. And they boast tens of thousands of converts and members yearly. But they say the only way God deals with you is holy writ. No goosebumps. And they always manage to put in no goosebumps, no feelings. Watch. No tongues. No jumping around. No spinning like a top. And I just kind of feel my Pentecostal head go slap, 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 slap. And I say, well, I'm not in any way going to be irreverent or disrespectful to the revealed Word of God. But if the spirit of the letter is not available then the letter kills. You know that you can read a book and you, if you're sensitive enough, you can pick up the spirit of the author. I've read articles about guys who are griping and complaining about holiness or complaining about politics or this or that. And I'm saying they've got the nastiest spirit. Even if they embrace truth, you can feel it bleed through. The spirit of the author can touch you far beyond what the letter says. Am I getting anybody hear me yet? Well, wait a minute, then let's make it here. The spirit of the author ought to be able to bleed through so that you get more than just a letter. And, and we are living in a generation that truly does not believe so-called Christianity, that God interacts with us. And their, their validation and their... Their point for all that is that, well, it'd be stupid and God's ignorant. Why did He give us the book and then turn around and have to talk to us? I said, well, I don't know. My dad gave me a house, but I enjoy talking to him. My dad gave me groceries every day, but I enjoy communication. My dad provided clothes for me and my brothers, but it was still nice to talk to him and go for a ride once in a while. I mean, what are we going to say? Hey, I gave you a thing. Don't talk to me. That's like having a church. If that concept is true, you have to carry the concept all the way through. From now on, we have church. We gather, we put the book up, and I'll be back for Sunday night. Why should I preach it? Can't you read? Don't you see how stupid that is? And these are some of the largest so-called denominations. Let's just say... God doesn't talk to you. I don't need God. I read this guy's up. I don't need God to talk to me. I have his book. I said, yeah. well, you're not doing too good reading the book. How do you get convicted? How does the Holy Ghost put you on your face? Oh, you don't let the Holy Ghost talk to you. 
It's crazy. Folks, hear me. We must have the active moving of the Spirit of God. It will never circumvent nor supersede His Word, but always validate and always vindicate our faith and His declarations of truth. Don't you understand? He's the living God. He said, make of a tabernacle and let me come among you. He didn't want Moses just coming down with all the rules and regulations. He said, I want to be among them. Now, if he wanted to do that in a covenant that the Bible said was inferior, how much more in a covenant that is superior? And I, and, and, and I tell you, just personally, I just kind of like what it feels. I just, I really enjoy it. I mean, I spent all them years in the Air Force, and my mother sent me those pineapple upside down cakes and cookies at Christmas and, and, and letters and all, but nothing matched the phone call. It's just something about Jeffrey. Hey, mom, how you doing? I didn't say, what are you calling me for? I got your letter. <laughs> That's the same kind of dumb spirit. What are you talking for? I got your letter. I'm going to tell you something. You can read nine pages of a letter and you can talk three minutes on a phone. It's not the same. You say all you want to and call me a wacko. But I know one thing. When they sign them letters sometimes when you had a girlfriend and they put those X's on the bottom. Now, Doc, you just hang on to them X's all you want to. But you'll see what happens when you get home to the fireflies. I mean, I, I, I'd, hate, I'd hate to come back. Been away 16 months TDY. I want to go home and kind of hug and kiss on and romance on my wife. And she just holds us up. Can't you read? I gave you 12 last month. Well, I'm trading the 12 for one real one. You hear what I'm telling you? I know it sounds humorous, but we are in dangerous times. And even in the Pentecostal movement, we're not careful. We'll justify an absence of God. Oh, hallelujah. God help us. So, the key ingredient must be grasped if we're going to appreciate this man's climax and trial of faith. And what is the key ingredient? It's so simple you already know it. God is always good. I just want you to grab it. Now, I know that doesn't sound profound, but it will be in a few minutes. The trial of your faith will bring you triumph. If you go into the trial of your faith saying in your heart, God is always good. I know what I'm talking about. I've been in some trials where I never gave the goodness of God a thought. I was too busy thinking how I can get out of this mess. And then when you can't get out of it, then you start finagling with your ignorant mind saying, Oh, why did God let this happen? And you cast a shadow on the goodness of God. And you start acting like an idiot. And then you don't enjoy church. And you don't enjoy the preacher. And the choir can't move you. And the Bible doesn't interest you. Come on, say it with me. God is always good. This is what you got to grasp. Because this is the secret of this trial of going up Moriah. He goes up Moriah because he believes in his heart. God's always good. And if God's always good, then nothing evil can proceed to me from him. It may attack my reason, my logic, my rationale, but I'm going by faith because this is a trial of my faith. This is not a trial of fact and figure. It is a trial of my faith. And sometimes reason will scream loud. You've got to breathe deep, get a deep breath, and let faith belch out of the inside of you and say, but God's always good. God never changes. There is no vacillation with Him. There is no shadow of turning. There is no variance with Him. He is always good. Oh, hallelujah. You hear me? He never varies. He never varies. Never, never switches one time to cruelty. But I've had my flesh tell me, 
I think he's being cruel. Now, none of you admit that, but I will. He's just not being fair. When you say God's not fair, you're, you're politely saying, you're cruel. Oh, they're going to get more quiet. Hallelujah. God is always good. God never varies. God never switches to cruelty. Watch this. God is always in control. I mean, He's in control. He's in control of the world's finance right now. He's in control of the disease right now. He's in control of this whole thing. You say it's out of control. <laughs> no, it ain't out of control. <laughs> don't, don't be that stupid. Go get drunk if you believe that. Go blow your brains out if you believe God fell off the throne somewhere and, and some other monarch's in charge. Friend, everything is moving exactly at the pace that God prophesied. This stuff has got to come to pass so that He can come get us. You know, God lets this thing be a utopia. We'll be like the Jews in Goshen. Who wants to leave? They never did want to go get Abraham's promised covenant land until God stirred up Pharaoh and raised one up that didn't know Joe and turned the heat up in a furnace. Then Israel said, you know what I mean? It's time to leave Goshen. You read it. You won't find one prayer request all the time they lived in Goshen saying, I'm wanting Canaan's land. They're saying, oh, well, Goshen's all right. But God just turns up the furnace. As soon as he turns up the heat, these cats put shoes on their feet. They say, I think it's time to leave. Don't you see God? If everything we have flows to us from God. Even faith is a gift from God. Grace is a gift from God. Even dissatisfaction is a working of God in our lives to create in us a yearning and a thirsting for something better. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And listen to this carefully. God is always constant with Himself. Let that say. He's constant with Himself. He does not change. Do you know that your failures don't change Him? Do you know that my mistakes don't change Him? It don't even change His purpose. Stay with me now. When you read Psalm 73, that's your homework assignment. You go home and read it. Psalm 73. Write yourself a little note. It is called the perplexed psalmist. When you read Psalm 73, David is so perplexed. He says, Truly God is good to Israel. To them they are a clean heart. But my feet were well nigh slipped. And I was almost gone. Because I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And I said, I know God's always good, but somehow I don't think He's being fair. And he says, I've washed my hands and kept myself pure and clean in vain. And while I tried to be pure and fast and pray and give my tithes and give the missions of faith promise and all the rest of it, these bimbos that hate God and watch X-rated movies are doing great. But you have to understand something. That's all they got. You don't get all the vile and the rotten of this world and then go on graduate and get the best of that world. You got what you got. Friend, I don't believe I've got what I've got yet. I got something good from that world, but there's something better coming. I'm living for something even greater than this. I just got the Holy Ghost, and that's the earnest of my inheritance. That's 10% down, and the rest is closing. There's something else coming in just a little while. The old patriarchs were right. This world's not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me. I just can't be at home in this world anymore. The Bible called me a sojourner. I am a stranger. I am a pilgrim. My citizenship is in another world. <laughs> Scripture says, leave the rich alone. They have received their reward. Jesus said, woe be to you that laugh now. You've got your reward. Woe be to you that have everything you want now. You've got your reward. 
But blessed are the meek. Blessed are the pure. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are they that suffer for righteousness sake. For great is your reward. Listen, honey, when God calls something great, it's beyond our cranium. You're not going to find too many times when God describes something as great. We use the word, but God said, Great is your reward. Boy, that's a declaration of mystery. Man, if God would have just said, Philip, your reward would be fine. Woo! But when he looked at it, he said, Oh, by the way, great is your reward. Woo! Friend, let me walk the mountain. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Psalm 73, the perplexed psalmist who is, is up, upset because somehow the ungodly seem to do great. I'm going to tell you something else. Job said, I looked for good and evil came. And God allowed it. And it seemed to be unfair. You're in good company when you don't understand trial. I'm going to tell you something. If you'd resurrect Job right now from the other world and say, was your trial worth the visit in chapter 41 and 2? Did your trial of your faith, did it make you into something you never were before you went through it? Did it open to you an understanding of the majesty of God? Do you understand without Job's suffering and trial, you would not have Job 38, 39, and 40? I don't know whether you've read that treatise lately, but you need to. Friend, when God starts putting up a poster of how grand He is, hey kids, stand up and gird your loins like a man. I'll demand an answer of you. Who is this that docking at council without understanding? Shooting a trap off and don't know what he's talking Get up, boy! Where were you when I made this thing? When I hung the world out over nothing and spun it like a ball of butter, who spoke to the oceans and the seas and said, Stop like that which issues from the womb and go no further. Hey, do you know the secret of the snow? Do you have any idea where death abides? Do you know where light comes from? Watch what he says. Does the rain have a father? Who taught the coney where to go? Who taught the hawk how to fly? Can you see like an eagle? Stand up, Job. You want a few questions? I'm going to ask you a few questions. By the time he finished, Job was a quaking and a shaking and said, Oh my God, I've heard of you with the, I've heard of you with the hearing of the air, but now my eye beholdeth you and I realize I am vile and I am nothing. I'm going to shut my mouth. Oh God, forgive me. I'm going to go on record right now. And the trial of your faith will never rape you nor steal from you your power of faith. Because the Bible said God used Job to pray for them so they could be forgiven. Don't you ever think, even if you fail in your trial, that you're going to lose the power to pray the prayer of faith. Because Job prayed it. And when he's finished, he's got twice as much. He was crying over what he lost. You have no scripture where Job ever asked for replacement. He's crying over what he lost. God, who is gracious, God, who is always good, said, Well, I'll give you what you lost twofold. <laughs> I'll give you more daughters and more sons. I'll give you more children. I'll give you wealth. I'll give you silver. I'll give you gold. I'll give you oxen and sheep. Everything you lost, I'll double. Job, was the trial of your faith worth it? Was it worth it? I used to bank at Sun Bank. I own Barnett. I own Empire. I own Atlantic. I own all the Ouija board people. I own everything. Yes, I think God, I'll, I'll, I think I'll do that again. You, you, know, you just laugh all you want to. I'm trying to find you here. Listen to me carefully. The test and our trial of faith is designed by God to develop us to the best level that we can be. 
The test and trial will reveal what you and I would normally conceal. And what we usually conceal is how we feel. But the test and the trial has a way of loosening thine tongue. For out of the abundance of the heart, the tongue flappeth. The trial of our faith carries within its trial the seeds and harvest of the future. If you stomp on your trial, you crush the seed of tomorrow's harvest. Well, listen to this. Ray, read for me. Deuteronomy 8, verses 1 through 3. All the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do. Yeah. That ye may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. Yeah. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee forty years in the wilderness. Isn't it funny how God thinks different than us? We go through some garbage and crud and we say, Well, I'm glad I'm through that. And I won't forget that. God says, Remember it. Yeah, never forget. <laughs> We want God to give us Holy Ghost apostolic amnesia. God wants to keep remembering. He said, Thou shalt remember all the way wherein thou hast gone. Man, we go through burying our loved ones and burying our children and, and losing money and going through bankruptcy and trials and problems and criticism and murmuring. My God, we don't even want to remember that no more. God says, Listen, pal, when I bring you through something, it is holy. Remember it. It's going to serve you again. Watch what he says. Remember all the way. Go ahead. And to humble thee. Wait a minute. No, back up. Remember all the way. Which the Lord thy God led these 40 years in the wilderness. Remember the way that God led you these 40 years. Watch this. To humble thee. There was a reason why. I wanted to humble you. I wanted to kill some more of your flesh. I wanted to get you from immaturity to growth. Watch this. Watch this next statement. And to prove thee. Ha! Hey, but one way you can prove that you love God. Obey. There's people say, I love Jesus and live like I want. Not hardly, honey. He said, I brought you this way to prove you. What? Prove me what? Read. To know what was in thine heart. Hey! I want to know what's in your heart. Mm -hmm. And the only way I'm going to know really what's in your heart is how you react to what I put you through. Remember, the heart's deceitful and desperately wicked above all things, and who can know it? And the Lord said, I'm going to prove it. I'm going to discover it. I'm going to make you come face to face with your own fallacies and your own mistakes and your own shortcomings so that you know that I love you. Don't you understand? The revelations of our own shortcomings and failures are no more than a master who's writing a beautiful canvas and a portrait to show us how lousy we are so that we could take no confidence in ourselves and how gracious He is. When we discover how cruddy we are, it never shocks him. He saw how cruddy we are before we started the test. Right. Mm -hmm. See, the whole thing is designed not just to make us ashamed and humble. It's to make us appreciate how wonderful the God is who called us. See, we get surprised by things. He ain't surprised. Okay, finish reading, right? Whether thou wouldst keep his commandments or no. See, I brought you through the way to prove you, to know what was in your heart, to see whether you would keep the commandment. Right. Because, you see, when the Lord gave them the commandment, when Moses came down, they said, all the Lord says we will do. And God says, we'll see. Right. Mm -hmm. And the minute they went a few days without water, you know what they had. They had a church election. They tried to kill the preacher. Only took a couple of days without water. And all these people said, Everything the Lord says, we will do. Hey, you stupid preacher, where's the water? Mm -hmm. Hey, Mo! 
with the water, baby. Uh, all that the Lord told you, you'll do. Yeah, I'll do it. Give me a little water. They get trapped in the Red Sea. Read it. The Bible says Moses cries out to God said, These people have already stoned me. I prayed that prayer. May not have been right, but I prayed it anyway. I said, These people have already killed me. Yeah, poor old preacher. I didn't ask to go up to the Red Sea. I could have went over this way. God told me to go over this way. I go over here and all the people get bent out of shape. But you are the folks that's going to follow the Lord everywhere He leads. Well, the Lord said, uh, march towards the Red Sea. First ten. <laughs> oh boy, I'm going to have to hurry. <laughs> okay. The trial of our faith carries within itself the seeds of tomorrow's harvest and the future. If you don't believe me, ask Joseph. The throne of Egypt is in the jail cell with him. Don't you get it? When Joe lays down at night, thinking about what's happened to him and the unfairness that's happened to him, I can just see him just kind of close his eyes and look over, and he sees the throne there in the jail. Is, uh, I'll get that after a while. I tell you what, I'll do. I'll just, I'll just handle this trial and let it develop my faith. And after a while, I'll sit on that. Because see, tomorrow's seeds are with me now in my dungeon. Oh boy, I'm saying weighty words, folks. When David did not kill King Saul, it became the greater miracle than when he killed Goliath. For the scripture says, he that governs his own spirit is greater than he that takes the city. When David said, I'll kill Goliath in the name of the Lord, but I will never touch God's anointed. I'll let God take care of that. Even when he cut off his skirt and cut the bolster, his heart smote him. He said, I shouldn't even have done that. I know he's had a fellowship with God, and I know he's in running from God, and he's in bad trouble and all that, but it's not my business to kill him. It's not my business to touch him. God will take care of him. I wish we could learn that as a move. That when people don't do right, people don't act right, you've got to just say, God, we'll take care of this. When does this church cease being His and become ours? Ah, huh, Lord, I, I, I'm here when I'm trying to tell you, I'm talking about the trial of your faith. But what did David kill the giant with? Anybody remember? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got all kinds of like all kinds of statements. David killed the giant with what David put in the bag. I'll let that sink a minute. You can't have victory if you don't invest. He didn't. I hear people. He killed them with faith. Faith don't kill people. Stones in the head kill people. I've heard people say he killed them with the word of faith. Oh, get out of here, the word of faith. You better have a rock with your word of faith. You know what the Bible says? He went to the brook and he picked up... Brother Bright, good to see you. He picked up five flat stones. That's an interesting statement. Any of everybody preach on that? Five flat stones. Why did he just say, picked up five stones? No, the Holy Ghost... The author of this book says he picked up five flat stones. Why does it say flat? You will find that in your commentary. Because the only way a stone can be flat is to go through the constant rippling of water that wears it down and gets rid of the rocky, pointy places. Watch me. Watch what I'm trying to tell you. The stone becomes flat because it's been through its own trial. And when it goes through its own trial, its rough edges are worn down so it can become of use in a greater sphere. Hard to throw a jagged rock 
but he finds one that's worn down from the raging and the rippling of the water. You see, the water is against the rock. The rock stands resisting the water. And the flow of life keeps wearing down the rock until it's ready to be used for the Master's use. And when it's time, he picks up a flat stone because he can be accurate with a flat stone. When God picks up David, David is jagged. But God is going to tumble him. And God is going to put him in the water of life. And God is going to take him out of the comfortable place. And God is going to let Saul chase him like a flea and like a dog. And God is going to keep working him until finally he is shaped and molded and he's smooth and he's ready for the king's use. This tumbling that we're going through. These ups and downs and in and outs that somehow we question in our mind. Where is God in all this? Honey, as long as you know you have not violently trespassed the will and purpose of God, you just let God's rushing water just tumble you down through the bed and let Him work on you. And when God chooses to pick out the time, God will pick you up and use you for a greater purpose than you ever would had you been out of the raging Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. The trial of our faith carries with it tomorrow's harvest. Ask the three Hebrews in the fiery furnace who affected a whole nation with the trial of their faith. When they said, God will deliver us out of your hand, we are matching our convictions against your customs. We will not bow. We will not play your rock and roll game. We're not into gospel rock. We won't do it. So you'll burn. Fine. Then our ashes will be a testimony that some people think this is wrong. God will deliver us. You know, when they threw them in the furnace, the only thing that burned up was their bindings. (laughs) I'm telling you, I'm saying weighty words here tonight, folks. It's smoking in my brain right now. Did you understand that? When he went in that furnace, the Bible said that they saw four of them loose. They found them. The furnace was supposed to burn them. But the only thing the trial did was loose them from the things that the world tried to bind them with. Let God have His way in your furnace. Oh, hallelujah. We also know that he affected the kingdom. We know about Daniel. We usually talk about Daniel. Every child knows about Daniel and the lion's den. That's unfair to Daniel. Why don't you say it this way? Daniel in prayer, then the den. You don't want to go to a den if you ain't going to prayer. (laughs) The only reason he got into the den is because he got into prayer. Now watch me. Prayer can be dangerous. It might cost you something. He knew what the king's edict was. He opened his window, prayed anyway. He wasn't a rebel at heart. He was to a higher command, a higher rule. And he gets put in the lion's den because he's a praying man. The trial of his faith. He affects the whole kingdom. All this crazy stuff I... I know I got in trouble once already, so it don't matter if I get in trouble again. Folks, we are not to be militant people. I know this bothers some of you, but we are not to be militant people parading against abortion, screaming and yelling about all these bars. We are not to be doing that. Trying to manipulate and maneuver and handcuff God and make Him put us as a senator and a representative and a city councilor. Come on, Doc. I've had people say, well, Joseph was the prime minister. Oh, did Joseph run for election? Oh, Daniel became the right-hand man, even to a third monarch. Yeah, was Daniel manipulating, or was he just living for God? Doesn't the Bible say, promotion cometh from the Lord? If we'll live godly and live by principles, 
and live in the Holy Ghost, I believe God can give us favor. God can plant us right in the spot we need to be. And God can put the church and people in the church as individuals or collectively center stage where we need to be. But we don't need to muscle up against senators. We don't need to lobby with a bunch of God haters trying to get a bunch of votes on something, friends. We've got more power on our knees when we go to the throne of grace and ask God to dispatch those two-thirds of those angels that are still on our side. We've got angels that outnumber the voters in this nation. And I'm going to tell you something else. That angel that shut that lion's mouth is still alive. I said, he's still alive, my friend. And he's in the lion's shut mouth business. Every angel that God ever created is alive. The Bible said they are heirs, ministering spirits to the heirs of salvation. That be others. Do you understand what a hundred kabillion, mazillion, florillion is? That, that, that computes in Hebrew and Greek innumerable. Do you understand? A company, Brother Brinkley, a company of innumerable angels. My God, all I need is one. God had one angel in the days of Hezekiah. He sent down in one night, killed 185,000 Assyrians. It didn't take him a ten minutes. I got access to innumerable angels. I've got the name of Jesus and the blood of Jesus and the spirit of Jesus and the word of Jesus. My God, don't fall, Jeffrey, in your trial of faith, but let it honor God and let it mature my own soul. Oh, hallelujah. Let me go quickly here. I'm sorry. I'm getting a little excited here. I'm sorry. I'll stay here. The key to this whole thing about him going up on Mariah, I ain't forgot, Abe. We're trying to get him up there. The key to him going up on Mariah and the key to this whole thing is this. Listen carefully. Not only is God always good, but the ways of God are beyond us. Please say it with me. The ways of God are beyond us. If we could take that every day into our, into our minds, into our vocabulary, and just walk around, that's not a fatalist, fatalistic outlook towards something and say, well, you still don't understand. No, just be honest and say, your ways are higher than mine. Your thoughts are higher than mine. You're greater than me. You live in the sphere that's higher than angels. You dwell in a place that no man can approach. You're so far beyond me. So whatever you decide you want in my life, you've got all the parts, all the pieces of the puzzle. You've got the kings, the pawns, the bishops. you got everything. You just move and stuff. All i got to just say is I can't figure it out. And I'm going to tell you, most of us get a frustrated, excedrin headache because we try to figure things out. You can't figure out God. You cannot figure out God. I can't figure out Calvary. I can't figure out the Holy Ghost. I can't figure out why He ever forgave me. Why He loved me. Why He's coming back for me. I can't figure that out, but I'm enjoying it. I'm thrilled about it. I'm excited about it. And I'm not leaving it. Stay with me real quick. I'll, I'll see if I can get through this Bible study. The ways of God are far beyond us. They are so high and they are so holy. His mind is infinite. His mind is eternal. His purposes are lofty. They are beyond our grasp. They say, beyond our grasp. Therefore, we must use faith. Because faith can reach beyond reason. Faith can leap past logic. Faith can run beyond rationale. That's why you have to use your faith. Everybody must be tried. Everybody must be tested. Every vessel must be tested. For it makes us purer, more holy, more pleasing, like Him. If Jesus Christ is our perfect example, and the Bible said He was tempted in every point. He was tried. He was tested. He was hurt. He knew what it was to be alone, to be misunderstood, to be beaten, to be mistreated, to be killed. And He also knew what it was to triumph. Then why do we want God to make us immune? One of the greatest hurts that has ever happened to the move of God. And I know that these precious people mean well. But folks, please believe me. It's incorrect. 
that if you name and claim scriptures and stand on scriptures, you're immunized. No! If you and I are immunized, we ruin the process of divine things that God can use to develop us. How does the stone get smooth? How does the muscle develop if there's no resistance? How do the lungs learn to hold air if you never go deep diving? Oh boy. Okay. Okay. You might say tonight, well, yeah, Jesus was tested and tried, but Jesus had a purpose. Correct. And the Here's our purpose. The same is found in Romans 4. It says that as Abraham did, we are to do. What are we supposed to do? Give glory to God. Listen to this. Faith and obedience are synonymous. If we believe God, we act. Now I'm going to get a little rude. Everybody take a deep breath. Let it out. Now watch. I'm going to get a little rude. If we believe God, we act. If we don't believe God, we don't act. And thus prove we don't believe. Faith must be translated into obedience. Obedience is faith translated into action. Without that translating, you either have triumph or tragedy. Listen to this. The Bible says, whatever is not of faith is sin. Why? You don't wonder why the Scripture says that. Whatever is not of faith is sin. Why does it say that? Here's why. Because if you don't act and react and respond and walk in faith, unbeknownst to all of us, we are saying, you are a liar. Your word is not true. Your promise cannot be counted on. I do not trust you. I told you I was going to get a little strong here. See? Whatever is not of faith is sin. Sin says to God, you're lying. I can't trust you. You're not faithful. Your promises fail. That's why people who don't walk in faith are going to be lost. See, we think if you believe Acts 2.38, quote, you're automatically saved. Not so, sweetie. We are called to a walk of faith. Listen to this. This is powerful. God did not try Lot's faith. Now, the Bible says every man's faith is going to be tried. But the Scripture says God did not try Lot's faith. He left that to Sodom. And Sodom was sufficient enough to reveal Lot had no faith active in God. He lived by sight and sense. What a tragedy that we would be relegated to this world trying our faith. Because we live by sense and sight. Obedience is the test of faith. Not words, but submission. You don't believe me? I must run quickly. Ask Naaman. Ask the lepers who were told to go show themselves to the priest. It was in obeying they were healed. Their obedience was their faith in action. The trial of their faith was to believe Jesus had told the truth. So they went to the priest. And as they were going, they were healed. The blind man was told to go wash in the pool of Siloam. The nobleman was told to go home. Thy son liveth. At Pentecost, they were told to repent. He water baptized in Jesus' name, received the Holy Ghost. Only 3,000 responded in faith. Faith without works, according to James, is dead. Being alone. 
The trial of our faith, Peter says, what's this? Is much more precious. He didn't say precious. He said much more precious than that of gold. Now, I've used that scripture for 20 years. I've heard a few people teach and preach on it. I've read a few books. But not till tonight did it ever come alive to me like I see it now. You ever wondered why? You know, it says that your faith, the trial of your faith, being much more precious than that of gold, though it be tried by fire. And and tonight, I was looking at that scripture and saying, much more precious than gold. Why? Why is the trial of our faith much more precious than gold? And it came to me. Gold is lifeless. It is forced into the fire without its will. But we willingly step into the fire. And God says, that's much more precious than this that has no choice. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Am I doing okay, Ray? Doing okay? Okay, I'm going to say, am I doing okay, choir? Are you cold up here? You want to turn the air conditioner down? Okay. Are you really cold? Oh, it's hot up here. Okay, let me go just a little bit further, okay? We're in Genesis 22. The Bible said the Lord told uh, Abraham, uh, Take thy son now, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Okay? That I will tell thee of. There are some trials that are yours only. And there are some things God will show you only. While you may suffer publicly, the revelation is private. It is possible in your trial for God to talk to you. I am against this concept that God does not communicate with us. That's garbage. He does communicate with us. This is is powerful. The scripture says, And Abraham rose up early in the morning. He rose up early in the morning. He is just like Apostle Paul in Galatians 1, 15 and 16, where Paul says, When I was converted and God revealed His Son to me, watch this, neither conferred I with flesh and blood. When God said it to Abraham, He didn't put it out for public opinion. What do you think? When Paul was dealt with by Jesus Christ, He didn't ask no advice. He did not confer with flesh and blood. Because flesh and blood will exert peer pressure. Do what you feel God is saying to your spirit. Do it. I'm telling you what I know. You confer with flesh and blood, you begin to confer with logic, with reason, with opinion, and after a while, your faith ceases to be faith, becomes sight and sense. I still remember when I was wrestling to come to this church as your preacher. And they had voted me in in Coco 100%. And I wanted to go to Coco. I didn't want to come here. Huh. Yeah, some of you say, I wish you would have went. Well, just give me a little time. I didn't want to come here. I like Cocos, Titusville, South Florida, Mike Williams, Hal Kennedy. My buddies were there. The human race was there. Tropical trees, ocean, no football. I didn't want to come here. I had people all over UPC calling me. Arnold, you need to go there, man. You build a great church. Nice little group. Blah, blah, blah. Gainesville. You don't want to go to Gainesville. Gainesville is uh, no, no, no. Gainesville. You didn't have a good reputation. And I said, well, everybody was telling me to join that parade and just go on that thing. But, but God had, had impressed me. God had dealt with me. God had 
dealt with me one weekend when Brother Oz was here. God had spoke to me all the way back home. This is where you're going to pastor. And I just couldn't get away from it. And finally called Brother Hopkins and said, I can't come. And they were all upset and blah, 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 blah. You know what threw me for a loop down there? They had a message in tongues and interpretation that verified me to be there. And it threw my head in a tailspin. And I started saying, Man, maybe I want something so bad I've grown insensitive to God. Now, none of you ever have that problem, but I do. And I'm going to tell you something. And I am an advocate of the gifts of the Spirit. And I flow in them and I function in them. And I function in the gifts of the Spirit a lot more away from here than I ever do here. But you cannot regulate your life by the gifts. You must have the voice. That persuasion of your spirit that makes you know. And I was back to being unemployed and frustrated. My wife had just had the baby and my God, we was broke. Didn't know what to do. Didn't know where to go. But there was such a peace settled over me and just said, you've made the right decision. And then all of a sudden this whole thing pulled together and came together. Boom, here I came. And, 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 and I'm, I'm still supposed to be here at least for the next 30 minutes. Hallelujah. I mean that. Okay, watch this. The next verses say, On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. Third day. What a picture. I don't have time to go into it. What a picture of Jonah and Jesus. Three days dead. Three days buried. Isaac is three days dead already. Typically, in the mind of Abraham, because God said, off him as a burnt offering. As far as Abraham is concerned, this kid's dead right now. And he's exactly three days till he gets there. It's a picture. Jonah's three days in the whale's belly. Jesus, three days, three nights in the bowels of the earth. Isaac is a picture of Christ. He's doing things typically. Jesus does things with substance. Now watch this. Scripture says, And on the third day, and Abraham went and said to the young man, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. Now watch what he did. First, he went alone. Just him and his son. Nobody else was going to see the transaction. You know, as far as we can see in the Scriptures and Calvary, nobody else saw the transaction either. Because God pulled down the shades and covered the whole place with darkness. And it was a transaction on Calvary just between father and son. Notice what he did said. We will go to worship. Hear what I'm trying to tell you. Faith is not occupied with the test or the trial. Faith is occupied with its object, who is God. I have lost some of the greatest blessings from God because I got myself honing in on the trial. And I missed the object. He says, we go to worship. Notice when he goes, oh my friend, he's not morbid. He's not crying in his root beer. He doesn't think the trial is a horror story that God made a mistake. He says, I'm going to make this worship. Okay. You know what he said? When he said, I will go worship the lad and I, he said, God will be with me in this situation because you can't worship if he ain't there. He will never leave me alone. His silence does, is not a sign of his absence. God so filled Abraham's heart, not the pain, not the price, not the feeling, not the impossibility, not the peer pressure, not the family, not the future. Just God. Faith and love were now being tested. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Therefore, we should let our submission be our admission. Why did he say, if you love me, keep my commandments? For only love will cause trust when knowledge is withheld. Folks, I'm saying weighty words. Whew. 
test of true love is obedience. He that hath my commandment and doeth them, he it is that loves me. We can never gauge by our feelings or our emotions or even our words. Only deeds declare. Okay, I got five minutes, all you folks worried. I got five minutes. Now here's what I'm going to finish with, because this is powerful. He says, We will come again. Hebrews eleven seventeen said Abraham believed that God was going to do something. He did not go to the trial foreboding, but he went thrilled. This will be fantastic, Abraham is saying. I don't know how, I don't know how, I don't know how. But somehow, God is going to raise this boy up after I kill him. He did not believe God was going to stop him. Hebrews 11.17 said he believed that God was able to raise him back up from the dead. He did not go into that trial. I think that's where I've missed a lot of benefits and blessings from God. I believe that when I was in the trial, before it really got really bad, God was going to stop it. And I missed it. Maybe God's not going to stop it. But what does it matter? Okay. <clears throat> here's, here's the most powerful thing I'm going to say right tonight. I got it written red. That means it's powerful. I want you to grab this because this you ain't never heard this. I promise you, you ain't never heard. What are you and I attempting that cannot be accomplished without the Lord's intervention? Let it set. What are you and I attempting to accomplish that's impossible without God's intervention? Does our fear of risk force us into restricted Christianity? Do we set up boundaries of living where we are sure we can handle it. Do we stay away from everything we cannot control with our finance or our ability? Has our walk settled into a set of self-determining possibilities? Does our vision, our voice, and our action reflect on the unlimited power of God or do we just play it safe? What areas of service and sacrifice have you and I avoided by simply saying why that's impossible? Here's what we're going to do. I don't have time to finish this now. Here's what we need to do right now. I want you to picture the person. I want you to picture the difficult situation. The illness, the crisis, the assignment, the financial problem, the marriage relationship, or whatever. I want you to picture it now. And we need to ask God to give us a vision of His will which will be impossible without His help. See what I'm saying? We function carefully with no risk without His help. We don't step far from the boat. Why take a chance? You know, God might be a liar. Who wants to trust a liar? God will probably fail me. I better hang on to the boat. Me commit so much a month, so much a week? Are you kidding? Not me, pal. I live my Christianity by self-determined possibility. Abraham walks up Moriah and unless God intervenes, it's over. That's where faith goes. Boom. 
words I'm saying are too heavy for you to run. It's not until we ask for the vision of His will about the person, situation, finance, circumstance, the difficulty, the marriage, the children, whatever it is. God, give us a vision of this thing. Of you intervening. That will be the only way faith will be released and His power will be released. And once again, it won't be just Bible characters who are Superman and Batman and Aquaman and Flash Gordon. And the people of Acts will not just be some wackos who walk through Acts, but now we will be the people of Acts. Don't you get it? Tell you what we do. God desires to invade the impossible with His intervening power. Tell you what we do. We got two minutes here. Take your hands like this, okay? See, put your hands out like this. I'm already nuts, okay? Put your hands like this. Now I want you to look in your hands, and I want you to put in those hands with your mind the situation, the individual, the marriage, the family, the problem, the crisis. And now we lift it to God. And ask Him to help us believe that He will intervene and make the impossible possible. Jesus, we need You now, Lord. We're at Moriah. And unless You intervene, either before or after the fact, Abraham does not come back with Isaac. It's beyond his, his, uh, his guardianship. It's beyond his guarantee realm. And Lord, there's people in this church right now that marriages are in trouble, finances are in trouble, problems with work, problems with taxes, problems with the IRS, problems with relatives, problems, problems, problems. And God, you're wanting to take this church to a dimension in faith that requires you to intervene. Would you look at this now, Lord? Would you look at this now? Jesus, help me to envision this thing. Not just see the impossible situation, but to have the vision of you intervening, thus making the impossible possible. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Heal that boy. Heal that situation. Oh, Jesus, come to the rescue of these situations. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Give us the vision to see it. Let us rise up early in our spirits now. Hallelujah. And step out by faith. Let our faith take a risk. Let our faith take a risk. Jesus in your name. Let's stand right now. Can we please? Oh, hallelujah. I don't know whether I'm helping you or not, but but oh my God. Now, I, I got a whole page of stuff. We don't need to go any further. We need to hit this place right here. Are you hearing what I just said? Maybe I need to read it again. Does our fear of risk force us to restricted Christianity? Do we set boundaries of living? That we are sure that if God doesn't give us a miracle, we can make it anyway. Do we stay away from everything that we cannot control with our finance, resource, ability, talent? Don't you see what I'm saying? We've been laughing and joking about going up with Abraham on Moriah. I don't think any of us understood the magnificence of Moriah. His faith is going up there, but his faith is taking him beyond where he can govern what's going to happen to Isaac. That's faith. Why don't you take a risk? Why don't you open yourself up and let faith become a risk? Oh, we gotta we gotta worship some more.
we got to hold it up again. Hallelujah. Jesus. Jesus. Help us now. The trial of our faith being much more precious than that of gold which perisheth. Jesus. Settle in on us now. Settle in on us now. Sing that song, would you, while we just worship a little? Oh, hallelujah. Jesus, take us beyond the boundaries of safety. Take us beyond the boundaries of dollars and cents and, and what we can safely do without being a tremendous risk. the safe. Look at those hands again. Look at those individuals. Look at the situation. God intervene. Give me a vision, Lord, of you intervening. God, give us a vision of you intervening. You can do it. Woo! Woo! You can do it, Lord. Hallelujah. reflect his power in the realm of the impossible are we still avoiding areas of sacrifice and service because we simply say it's just impossible to invade the situation and make the impossible possible. Let him intervene in it. Let him intervene in it. O oh Lord God Almighty, ruler of heaven and earth and king of kings and lord of lords, he that is and was and shall ever be God, Lord, we stand now again at the plateau, not understanding very much of what we have even spoken about, knowing the provoking and the driving and the moving within our hearts to take us beyond the place where everything is safe, to step out into the choppy waters of come, into the high place of Moriah, offer up Isaac, Jesus Every one of us has got impossible situations, but they're not impossible to you. We need you to intervene, but we can't get you to intervene as long as we won't take the risk, as long as we won't go beyond the boundaries that we ourselves set up as things that are safe. Oh, Jesus, give us understanding, please. Grant us a fresh vision. Oh, Lord. Nothing is too hard for you. Nothing is impossible with you. Lord, help us. God, I, I want to go beyond just that which is safe and secure. 
to be bold, to be courageous, to have reckless faith, to stand on the Word, to know that You've spoken to my spirit, that You've dealt with my heart. Oh, God, anoint our eyes that we could see, that we could have a vision of that victory. Deliver us, Lord. Take us to the high place of Moriah. Take us, Lord. There's no way Abraham could do anything about it. It was in your hands. Let us put it in your hands. Oh, Jesus. Hallelujah. Yes, go ahead, sing. Oh, yes, go ahead, sing. To God. To God. To God. For things He has Every step Abraham ever took was going a little further beyond the first risk. Going beyond the second barrier. Going beyond the third boundary. Till finally it climaxes on Moriah where everything is totally out of his hands. And God has just got to do it. Woo! 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 For faith pleases God. And faith releases God. And faith brings God into the situation to demonstrate His power to deliver. And His power to intervene. And His power to transform. Woo! Woo! Jesus! Woo! Jesus! Hallelujah! Oh, hallelujah. May the hand of God be upon you and bless you and give you peace. May the countenance of Jehovah Himself, the great God of eternity, bless you and lead you and guide you and direct you. May somehow in His kindness and yet in His desire to mature all of us and conform us to the image of Christ, break down the barriers that are built by fear to move beyond the boundaries that somehow say no risk, no further. There are some places that say swimming at your own risk. I think God is trying to tell us, take a risk. Take a risk. It just flashed to my mind when Patty Arnold and I went evangelizing. We had no revivals. We had no money. We had one man, Robert Forbes, invited me to speak for him. That's all I had. Didn't know nothing. Scared to death. Sold everything I had. Everybody thought I was a fool, but I knew what was alive in my heart. And I said, the God that had brought me out of the drunken barroom balls and brought me out of the hunky tunks, surely he who had supernaturally brought me out would supernaturally guide me and supernaturally keep me and would expand the horizons of my mind and open up a place in God. And God has never failed me, and God's not failed any of us. But we sometimes have moved with midget steps. But do you not hear the pounding drumbeat of the angel of death? Do you not feel the warmth of Armageddon on the horizon? We no longer can take our little pygmy Pentecostal steps. God is saying, trust me. Step out. Step out. Give me the person. Give me the episode. Give me the crisis. Give me the situation. And let me work in faith. God bless you. I'm finished. I have nothing else to say. I've got somebody to baptize. Thank you. Brother Bright, you're preaching for us Sunday morning? Amen. I don't know what we're doing Sunday night. Maybe God will put them under conviction. Hallelujah. We're at church while I'm gone. I have to be gone for the conference. Please don't lay out of church. Let's have standing room only. Let's have revival while I'm gone. Amen. I'm not the church. You're the church. Man, if I leave for a month, you ought to be able to pray 50 people through the Holy Ghost. Amen. 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 We're not finished with Mariah. We'll come back again. You knew that when we started. Hallelujah.
Ryan Stone. 